Edison was born in Milan, Ohio in 1847. His father had settled there after escaping Canada because he'd been involved in a uh, aborted revolution there, had come down into Milan, settled in the town because it was just uh, developing a canal system that was really important in the wheat uh, fields uh, in the surrounding area and actually uh, next to Odessa, Russia in that era, Milan, Ohio had the largest shipment of wheat. So when they settled there, it was a very prosperous town and then the railway passed it by and by uh, 19, 1854, which is uh, when they moved to Port Huron, Michigan, uh, where other family members had settled. Um, Milan was in decline. Uh, Port Huron was kind of an up-and-coming lumber area. And so Edison grew up in this area where lumber was one of the principal uh, businesses. Uh, his father was a relatively um, prosperous um, uh, independent entrepreneur. He did a lot of things over the course of his life, but at various points the family struggled for money. And so it's very likely that Edison, after briefly attending uh, a local school run by a fellow named Reverend Engel, uh, was drawn out of the school because of financial uh, setbacks that the family faced. But the story that's always been told was that his mother took him out of the school because the teacher called him addled and there was some sense that he wasn't paying enough attention and so forth. Other than the stories, we don't know one way or the other why he uh, didn't attend the school after that brief period of time. His mother ended up homeschooling him, largely with the books from his father's library. His father was a free thinker, so Thomas Paine, uh, uh, Gibbons' The Fall of Rome, all sorts of uh, books of that nature were what Edison was reading as a young boy. Um, we do know that he read a science book, Parker's Natural uh, Philosophy, sometime uh, around the age of 12. Uh, and we know at that time he also briefly attended the new Union School in Port Huron. But he only attended for a brief period of time and then he went to work. He began to work as a train boy between Port Huron and Detroit, selling newspapers, magazines, candy. Uh, while on the train, he actually set up a little printing press. He got an old proof press from the uh, Detroit Free Press editor and some type and published news along the rail line. Um, he also set up a little chem lab in the train, and fortunately there was an accident, a small fire, and so he had to take the uh, chemical uh, set home, but he did continue to experiment in his basement. So Edison was already interested in science and technology. Edison was uh, born in Milan, Ohio in 1847. It's the same year the Telegraph arrived in Ohio. And he basically grew up with this uh, high-tech technology of the day. And the railway uh, was actually controlled by messages sent along the Telegraph route uh, paralleling the, uh, the railway lines. Uh, Edison would stop in the stations, talk to the telegraphers. He actually got some instruction from them. And then one day he saves the life of one of the telegraphers' young son who was out playing in the uh, rail yard. A boxcar got loose. He scoops him up, and the guy gave him private instruction. Edison gets a job in um, Port Huron at the jewelry store, which is also where the telegraph office was. And it's a kind of part-time telegrapher. And then goes on to become a full-time telegrapher, kind of uh, working throughout the Midwest uh, uh, in a number of different companies it was a good way to see the world. When he starts, it's in the middle of the Civil War. A lot of telegraphers had been drafted into the Signal Corps, and so it was easy for Edison to get a job, and if he tired of one place, it was easy to move on. But he also experimented in these years, and we know that there was a lot of um, work that he did just sort of taking the instruments that were surplus instruments available in various offices and fooling around with them and experimenting. Um, this was a period where uh, the telegraph system had just, was just in the process of being consolidated after the Civil War. In fact, Western Union finally builds a national system for the first time. And one of the problems is that with battery power, you can send about 250 miles, so you need a way of repeating the messages. Um, early on, you had to have a telegrapher at each station uh, at about 250 miles that would relay the signal, but eventually people began to develop automatic ways of doing this, and that's one of the things that Edison worked on. Uh, in fact, one of the um, Edison's contemporaries at the time uh, talked about how 
you know, designing repeaters was sort of the entree for an embryo electrician, as he called them, uh, both people who later went on to become electrical engineers or inventors like uh, Thomas Edison. Edison was working on a number of different technologies as a telegraph operator, but his breakthrough comes when he moves to Boston. Boston has a lot of advantages over the Midwest. First of all, it's teeming with machine shops. And in the 19th century, the machine shop was the inventive laboratory. That's where you could take your ideas, and these very skilled experimental machinists could take an idea and turn it into something you could experiment with and improve. Uh, and, in fact, one of the first things Edison does after arriving in Boston is he goes from shop to shop, uh, discovering what's being done there, and then writes an article about it for the Telegrapher, which was sort of a, a newspaper for telegraph operators that had both technical and personal news in it. Edison actually finds room uh, to experiment in the shop of Charles Williams, Jr., one of these manufacturers. There, was, there were other inventors who also worked in that shop. And he experiments with a number of different items, but his first patented invention is a legislative vote recorder uh, that would automatically record votes in a legislature. This is one case where he was reading about the development of this new technology in, in the uh, telegrapher and the journal of the telegraph. Um, but what happened once he actually developed this thing and tried to uh, interest, well, apparently he takes it down to Washington, tries to interest Congress in it, he discovers that legislators don't actually want to speed up the process, right? They want to trade <laughs> and um, put stuff in the bill that uh, benefits their constituents. And so what ends up happening is if you speed up the process, that uh, reduces their ability to control uh, the legislation, and so they turned him down. And Edison said that that was one of the things that taught him to better study the markets that he was entering. While the vote recorder failed as an invention. His other key invention that he patents uh, not long after is a printing telegraph. And what a printing telegraph enables is stock ticker technology. Uh, Edison didn't invent the stock ticker. A fellow named Edward Callahan did. But this technology had just been introduced when Edison gets to Boston in 1868. And so it's one of the things he works on. He actually sets up a little stock and gold exchange uh, in Boston. Um, and then after coming to uh, New York City uh, for experiments on yet another uh, technology that he's working on, he discovers that this is the center of this new ticker technology, you know, or market reporting technology. That's where Edward Callahan's Golden Stock Telegraph Company is located. That's where the Samuel Law's Gold Reporting Exchange is. And Edison uh, actually um, gets a job working for Law's, making some improvements in the technology that Law's is using. Uh, and then he, that company is bought out by Golden Stock. Edison is briefly out of a job, uh, but because of the work he'd already been doing in that area, uh, he's soon hired by Golden Stock as a contract inventor. And the contract is really important, not just because this is Edison's first really significant contract. He'd had some smaller uh, contracts that helped him to develop some of these earlier technologies, but this is the first one where he's really being uh, contracted by a significant company in the industry to do work. Just as importantly, it gives him money for, to set up a little experimental shop. This becomes his first manufacturing shop. And so Edison begins to not just use it for experimental purposes, but then sells to Golden Stock uh, his stock ticker that, that he's developing for them. And so he becomes an inventor manufacturer. Um, the technology that develops from uh, Golden Stock, especially his universal stock ticker, has some very important improvements uh, that become standard in all the stock tickers that uh, evolve from it. And this is what begins to make Edison's reputation in the industry. The uh, president of Western Union, uh, he's, he comes to Edison's attention, uh, and he sees Edison as one of the leading electromechanicians in the telegraph industry, as he calls him. When Edison began working on electric lighting, there had been 40 years of experiments on light bulbs. And there were lots of light bulbs, including some that had been lit and stayed lit for three weeks at a time, on exhibit. People had seen them. But none of these light bulbs were in any way suitable for ongoing commercial use. And what Edison's contribution was, was to understand first that in designing a light bulb, 
he needed to think about the entire design of the system, its electrical operation, what the relationship was between the light bulb itself, the kind of generators that were used. And this is what sets Edison apart. That and the fact that he was able to do simultaneous invention on lamps and generators and other parts of the system because by the time he started working on electric lighting, he had established himself as the premier American inventor, uh, largely through his work first in the telegraph industry and then most importantly his invention of the phonograph, the first way to record and actually play back sound, which astounded people. It's how he becomes the wizard of Menlo Park. And not long after, he takes up the challenge of electric lighting and is able to get a company formed largely with money from the telegraph industry that supports him to an enormous extent in his inventive efforts. He expands his laboratory. He develops a real research and development laboratory. He develops team research. And so he's able to attack the problem in both a systematic fashion and on a broad a range of different elements of that system. As Edison begins to develop the Menlo Park Laboratory, increasingly he grows the size of his staff. Most of the early uh, people involved in the shop were either machinists, experimental machinists, or uh, people who had uh, practical experience in electricity, uh, often from the work they did with Edison in his earlier shops in Newark. Charles Batchelor, who becomes his main experimental assistant for many years, was a machinist who had come to Newark to set up the Clark thread mills uh, and then gone to work uh, as foreman of Edison's shop. And uh, he becomes Edison's principal assistant and learns about electricity sort of on the job, if you will. And a lot of his experimental assistants started that way. As the work on electric lighting progresses, he begins to hire new people, um, PhD trained chemists, uh, he hires the first ever person with a Master's of Science from Princeton University, Francis Upton, as one of his key assistants. He begins to hire other college-educated uh, experimenters, but it's still largely sort of um, practically trained uh, people that are involved as uh, Edison's experimenters. A lot of people wanted to come to Edison's laboratory because of his reputation, and many of them had ambitions to be inventors in their own right. And one of the ways they realized that they could learn to be inventors was to learn from the master, Edison. And so this was true at uh, Menlo Park. And then when Edison builds a larger laboratory in West Orange, New Jersey, in the late 1880s, the same thing happens. Although there, increasingly, there are more and more college-educated people. Uh, one of the people who comes to him in uh, West Orange, a fellow named Reginald Fessenden, had a uh, degree in engineering. But he came to Edison because he really wanted to be an inventor, not an engineer. And uh, he later goes on to uh, have some very important inventions in radio technology. Um, between the period that Edison was at um, Menlo Park and uh, West Orange, uh, he was actually uh, operating a number of different manufacturing shops, which is where a lot of the inventive work in making the electric lighting system uh, practical and improving it uh, took place. Um, one of the people that was hired there was a fellow named Nikola Tesla. Tesla had all sorts of ideas for improving electrical systems. He later goes on to develop the first really practical alternating current system that could incorporate motor technology. When he's working for Edison, he's also thinking about developing uh, an arc light system. Arc lights were very bright lights used for street lighting. Uh, Edison wanted to develop uh, an incandescent street lighting system, didn't want to develop the arc lighting system. Tesla leaves him, uh, although his arc lighting company fails, his plans for uh, alternating current are taken up by the Westinghouse Company. And uh, like so many inventors, um, people at the time didn't know who Nik Nikola Tesla was until many years later. Uh, at the time, that system was actually developed and promoted by the Westinghouse Company. And so it was known as the Westinghouse system, not the Tesla system. Edison seems to have had a great appreciation for the role of media. Once he invents the phonograph and sees the power of the publicity that comes to him as a result of this uh, new technology, where he becomes world famous within a matter of a few months.
Um, I think this really confirms in him how important it is to promote his inventions through the newspapers, through the media. And from that time on, uh, Edison is very seldom out of the newspapers. And I think one of the reasons that he's so attractive to people is he's sort of both this everyman, but somebody who seems very special. And so there are all sorts of ways to uh, write articles that kind of capture both this personal aspect and, and all, all the new and exciting things he's doing. And of course, as an inventor, he always seems to have something new he's working on. And so Edison was always uh, very willing to use the press for this purposes and was very successful in promoting himself. And I think it's one of the reasons why um, the Edison name became so associated with both high quality technology and with the electrical industry is because of Edison's promotional efforts. What's so surprising is that Edison, who invented both the first technology for recording and playing back sound and the standard telephone transmitter that was used in all telephones until we went digital, was very hard of hearing himself. His hearing loss began about the time he was working on the train between uh, Detroit and Port Huron. There are a couple of different stories he tells about when he first began to experience the hearing loss. One is that when there was a little fire because of his chemistry set that the conductor got upset and boxed him on his ears. Uh, another is that one day he was late and the conductor actually pulled him up by his ears and he felt something snap. Uh, there's also some evidence that he had some illnesses as a child um, and so it's possible that he had scarlet fever and sometimes this will create a condition that um, will lead to a deafness later on. Uh, he does seem to have some sort of degenerative uh, hearing uh, issue in his ears. Around the turn of the century, he actually had an operation uh, on his ear. And it was progressive. It was over time. So when they were working on the telephone, for example, they actually used Edison's ability to hear something as kind of a measuring tool, if you will, for how good the sound was coming through the telephone. Edison also took advantage of his hearing loss. He said that as an operator, he wasn't distracted by other noise. He could always hear the sounder of the telegraph uh, instrument. Later on, he said that it allowed him to concentrate better when there was noise in the shop. And then as he grew increasingly uh, hard of hearing, he said it was a good excuse not to engage people in conversation. He didn't much like parties or uh, large occasions, and so he would use this as an excuse uh, not to participate as well. Over the course of his life, he did become nearly entirely deaf and, and um, in a ironic twist, uh, Edison, who was one of the key people in the invention of motion pictures and from the beginning had tried to develop sound motion pictures, marketing a uh, kinetophone device, as he called it, uh, in around 1913 and actually tried to sync up silent pictures with phonograph recordings. Uh, when sound recordings do emerge in the late 1920s, Edison was so frustrated by the fact that he couldn't hear that he felt that movies had lost you know, all interest to him, that the, the, uh, the whole process of, of movie making had changed and he was now shut out of the world of, of enjoying movies. One of the things that uh, happens after Edison introduces the DC or direct current system of electric lighting into commercial use is that there are a lot of people working on improving it. Uh, but there are also people thinking about an alternative system, what was known as alternating current. Um, the difference between the two systems is that with alternating current you could uh, generate much higher uh, voltages of electricity and transmit them using much uh, thinner copper conductors. Um, in fact, that was one of the key elements of Edison's system was to figure out how to reduce the size of the copper conductors. But alternating current had an even greater advantage. The problem was you had to transmit at very high voltages that could be fatal uh, and then find a way to step down those voltages before they entered into buildings that people were using. Uh, and so safety was always a concern with alternating current. Um, Edison, in fact, investigated alternating current when it was first introduced. Uh, at the time, it was not more economical than the uh, DC system already in existence. It took a few years for it to uh, show that it was much more economical because of the ability to transmit uh, over longer distances. 
but as um, electrification proceeded, rather than having stations at periodic points within uh, a city, for example, you could have a big generating plant and then a distribution system. Um, uh, the same thing for suburbs. You wouldn't have to put a noisy, messy uh, generating plant in the suburb. You could generate the power elsewhere and wire it in. And so there was a lot of incentive to develop alternating current. Edison invested in uh, the DC system, uh, both personally and financially. Um, once he was investigating it, he was very concerned about this issue of the high voltage. And there was good reason for him to be when he was introducing uh, direct current systems in cities like New York. There were a lot of overhead wires, including new uh, wires for uh, high voltage alternating current arc lights for street lighting. Um, every once in a while, these arc light uh, wires would cross with a telegraph or telephone wire, and a poor lineman who had gone up to repair the wire would be electrocuted. Um, in fact, there was a dentist in Buffalo who had seen this happen in the city. In um, 1887, the state of New York began to investigate alternatives to hanging. Uh, what they were looking for was a mu more humane way of executing criminals. Um, and the dentist had seen this happen. He saw it as an instantaneous um, act and wrote Edison, is this a humane way of uh, execution? Will this be instantaneous and relatively painless? Edison answers back, yes. Um, this begins to entangle him in this whole promotion of a, an alternative to hanging. And then because of this uh, interest of New York State, Edison becomes involved sort of behind the scenes in trying to promote the use of electrocution. Uh, he doesn't design the electric chair, but he does give a lot of advice on how to do the electric chair. There's a hearing, actually, a uh, court hearing over whether the first criminal who's going to be executed in the electric chair should be executed that way, whether it's uh, cruel and inhumane. Uh, there's lots of testimony, medical doctors, other electricians. But Edison, as the leading expert in electricity, as people thought at the time, sort of trumps everybody else. Uh, unfortunately, the electrocution is botched because, contrary to Edison's advice, they don't actually have a real electrician overseeing the operation. And so they actually do it wrong. But nonetheless, New York State does adopt the electric chair, as do many other states. Um, and it isn't, in fact, uh, until first uh, gas chambers are developed, another attempt to you know, have humane execution. And now today, of course, we have uh, lethal injection as yet another effort, but one again that's being challenged in the courts as to whether, in fact, it is uh, humane or not. The irony of this is that Edison actually opposed capital punishment. And then later regretted, in fact, having anything to do with the electric chair. Even in the 1920s, as the voltages went up into the uh, tens of thousands, Edison was still opposing uh, high voltage distribution of electricity through alternating current. Ironically, of course, there's no Edison company today, although there are lots of Edison illuminating companies that descend from his original plants, uh, Con Edison in New York being one of them. Edison's own companies, first his phonograph company, goes out of business in the late 1920s, couldn't compete with radio and with new improvements in the technology, electric recording and other things. The company still continued to exist. It was producing storage batteries, still producing a cement manufacturer, uh, was actually manufacturing uh, spark plugs and other things at the end of his life. Uh, the company continued to operate uh, for some time uh, under the direction of his son, Charles Edison, later governor of New Jersey. But subsequently, the company was sold off. Uh, and so the, the Edison company no longer exists today. Um, but during his lifetime, Edison and his company were associated with sort of leading edge uh, technologies. We tend to think of Edison's impact as, as being first his inventions, but actually the most important impact that Edison may have had was in fact changing the way invention was thought about. 
Uh, when Edison started, invention really was the province of individuals working alone or with one or two assistants, uh, often working in this machine shop environment. What Edison did was to create the world's first true research and development laboratory for invention, to look at the relationship between the inventive process and subsequent innovation in the marketplace, to see that invention didn't stop once the technology moved out of the laboratory, but continued in the production facilities and in the operating rooms wherever the technology was being used. He transformed invention into a process of innovation that's very modern in a lot of respects with research and development and with this sort of larger vision of innovation. Uh, and that's what enabled him to be so successful. And that's what allowed him to essentially establish three different industries. He was the key inventor in the establishing the electric light industry. He invented sound recording. Other people took it up, and then Edison jumped back in, and again, his company becomes the first and lead company in the early sound recording industry at the turn of the century. And then with motion pictures, Edison's first to market, although others moved beyond him uh, and eventually improved the technology. And then he was involved in telecommunications. Uh, very important improvements to telegraph technology. He invents the standard telephone transmitter. These are all things that continue to be used for a long time. And so Edison was both somebody who helped to transform the way that invention took place and was thought about, and then invented in a lot of key areas that continue to sort of dominate our lives today. It's hard to imagine a world without electricity and without sound recording motion pictures and telecommunications, and these are all things that Edison played a crucial role in.